Okay, um, welcome to the uh, lecture this week on culture and media in Soccer 101. This week I'll be covering this topic uh, across four different recordings, uh, the introductory thinking about culture, the media and capitalism, and I'll be kind of doing some bit more definitional work around what the media and popular culture is, then we'll be looking at some critical analysis of um, pop culture and media and, uh, along the lines of the Frankfurt School in particular. And in the last section, I'll be looking at um, ways of thinking about culture and identity. And all of these are in terms of things like consumer culture and media as well. So let's get started in the first part. Um, culture is one of those words that has many different meanings. Um, Raymond Williams, in a really famous text called Key Words, uh, described it as one of the hardest um, words in the English language to define. And I suppose, ironically, culture means different things in different cultures. So... Um, but the way we're going to use it here, it's a kind of a way of thinking about how, you know, the norms are around us when we're born into the world and what we're socialised through in many ways. So um, culture socialises in the terms of how we view the world around us um, and it kind of has implications then on how we feel comfortable and uncomfortable in some situations, the different morals we have, um, our different tastes, our different likes. Um, this relates to things like traditions. Um, historical traditions, you know, myths and things like that about the nation and war, uh, religious traditions. Um, and these things get passed on then to next generations. Now, importantly, um, they get passed on in different ways and um, they mean different things to different people that we'll um, go into in some detail throughout the rest of this lecture. So broadly, culture is our shared language, knowledge, material objects, behaviour, all those kind of things, the way they kind of total into a kind of way of being, a way of life, um, and can loosely defined as sets, of, as sets of beliefs, traditions and practices. I suppose one of the ways that culture is most noticeable as an individual is when you're feeling like a fish out of water, when, say, you're in a country with a completely different um, culture, with a different set of practices, different expectations, you know, uh, walking or driving on different sides of the road, very different foods, all these kind of things can... Um, make us feel like a fish out of the water that really brings your own kind of cultural um, norms and things you take for granted uh, much more to the fore. So in the chapter there's um, numerous ways that we point out that different sociological, um, cultural, uh, critical traditions have thought about culture and kind of used it um, to think more broadly about how societies function and also about how inequalities form within those societies. Durkheim in particular saw culture, culture as central to how societies function. Um, religion, for instance, you know, being a kind of reinforcing bonds of solidarity, like-minded people, um, you know, getting together and having similar views on the world, ways of kind of dealing with um, the, the supernatural. And this also for Durkheim, you know, when there's these strong bonds of solidarity between people and groups, minimises what he called anime, a kind of restless kind of uncertain way of being in the world. In the more recent times, um, and throughout the 20th century, Durkheim's ideas were developed to think a little bit more broadly outside of religion, but to think about how there's other things that go on, other co collective kind of practices that happen that um, in some ways play a similar function as religion. Um, Bella, for instance, pointed out that there are other cultural forms that give people similar feelings, similar bonds, and these are often organised around the nation. National symbols, rituals, celebrations. You know, in the US, Independence Day, in Australia, I think it's Australia Day and Anzac Day and stuff like that, that gets um, the citizens of a country to kind of, you know, invest in the history of their uh, nation, and there's kind of cultural rituals and stuff like that that build around that. For Durkheim, these kind of rituals um, produced what he called collective effervescence, this kind of, you know, almost joyous convivial feeling of being connected to other people like yourself and other people that are invested in those same practices. So when people worship a god for, for Durkheim, they're also kind of worshipping the society that they're in, and they connect these things together through different symbols and totems, like you know, in that case, the Bible, in the more national case, a coat of arms. These are kind of organising symbols that people um, then use to kind of communicate 
their own kind of thoughts and beliefs and feelings and connections to things. Again, sociologists have broadened this idea out to think about how this isn't necessarily just about religion or even just about nationalism, but also as a way of thinking about things like, you know, sports and concerts, um, festivals, these kind of places where kind of masses of people gather together to, you know, do a particular thing, um, see a band, support a particular team. These, for this kind of sociological perspective, um, that collective effervescence happens around those kind of rituals and practices as well. It's important though to remember that these kind of rituals and this kind of collectiveness is also exclusionary. So these collective effervescence don't bond everyone together, they're exclusionary, they sometimes discriminate, they marginalise, and in particular in terms of the kind of more nationalistic ones, they whitewash and rewrite history and tend to form a dominant narrative. And we can relate this back to what I was talking about in previous weeks over kind of the scripts that we kind of follow in society and um, around, you know, things like, say, Foucault's notions of discourse and stuff like that. These dominant narratives are often kind of distort um, the reality of our historical past. So f moving through this kind of more functional understanding of these collectives um, and in the way that they are kind of, these kind of cultural practices have different meanings for different people, um, the more Marxist critical side of things tends to see many of the things that happen in culture, particularly popular culture and consumer culture, um, things like you know going to concerts and supporting sporting teams, as being the products of ideology, or at least producing um, individuals that tend to follow dominant ideologies. And we'll go into that in much more detail in the third part of the lecture this week. From this critical perspective, culture is a key disseminator of ideology. It's a kind of way of, in some ways, keeping stupefied. So um, if you're interested in a kind of critical take on that, there's a link there to um, a documentary about uh, Slavoj Žižek's work about ideology. And in that little snippet, he uses the film They Live, which is stars the uh, wrestler Rowdy Roddy Piper, um, who finds a pair of glasses that can uh, uh, reveal ideology to him in day-to-day in -day life. So um, if you're interested in having a look at that, stop the video the lecture video and, and have a quick look at that now and then come back. Okay, so the um, two key kind of early sociologists when thinking about uh, culture, um, again, this is kind of more westernised forms of culture, is uh, Norbert Elias and Thorsten Veblen. Elias's work is particularly foundational when thinking about civilising processes, civilising in inverted commas about the way that kind of cultures develop these rituals around things like manners and, you know, having dinner and using the right fork and all that kind of stuff, various kind of social expectations and conventions. And Elias, what I think is particularly interesting around bodily functions and fluids. And there's that kind of great quote there that there was instruction manuals back in the time that he was studying this stuff, you know, belch thou near no man's face with a cor corrupt formosity, for that swerves from cour courtesy. Essentially, there's these kind of instruction manuals to teach people how to be mannered, civilised. Um, you know, there's those stories about, you know, even kind of the elites kind of getting earwax and people at dinners and trying to put it on each other and you know, all this kind of stuff. So um, there's an interesting way of thinking about this, though, in the sense of not just kind of being more hygienic. Elias points out that many of these rules tended to kind of move towards forms of exclusionary class-based kind of um, functions. So they're civilizing in a sense, but what they were also doing was a kind of group of elites, group of kind of rich people, and you can see this represented in um, uh, various pop culture shows that show the royal families, you know, that are in court, um, drawing up these kind of boundaries between them and the great unwashed masses, masses. And from this we get kind of developments of things like snobbery um, and and stuff like that, and status that um, we'll be looking at in some detail when we look at Weber's work in the week on class. And these kind of status distinctions then permeate throughout most of our, uh, throughout cultures, throughout the last couple of centuries. There's even these kind of, you know, status systems between, you know, rich people. There's kind of old money and new money um, that kind of tend to distinguish between the snobbish and the vulgar. So Veblen was particularly interested in this kind of um, conspicuous consumption, and this, you know, the big kind of Russian billionaire boat there at the, on the screen. Um, and he argued that this kind of conspicuous consumption that developed 
throughout the like eight, late eighteenth century, you know, the nineteenth, yeah, the seventeenth and eighteenth century. Um, conspicuous consumption demonstrated status above those, and to express that kind of upwardly mobile thing that was happening at the time. So these types of developments, these kind of civilizing processes, these these kinds of conspicuous consumption, are embedded the way that our cultures have developed, and, and they kind of maintain these social relations. Conspicuous consumption is particularly prevalent today in the um, in the you know social media reality TV world, you know, Kardashians and and people like that. Okay, so much of the way that we engage with culture today is through the media. So particularly today, there's like 24-7 hours, 24-7 news, um, the internet, you know, social media, we're constantly connected to it through our smartphones. So the media, in inverted commas there, is both the kind of technology that we use, but also the kind of genres and different platforms that um, we engage in as well. So some sociologists argue now that the media pretty much is culture, that there's not a lot outside of it, and then we kind of lead a media life. Um, but it's important to kind of break down, I think, some of the distinctions that happen in this. So there's mass media versus niche media. Mass media is kind of those, you know, those big forms of communicating to the masses, um, metropole, national, global populations. Niche medias tend to be um, aimed at more kind of smaller audience for specific purposes. So mass media are macro in scale and scope. Niche media is micro in their reach. And we'll go into some of the micro stuff when I talk about subculture later on. There's also a distinction made between old and new media. And I suppose this is always related to context. Um, so, you know, maybe in the 1900s, the printing press was new media and, you know, um, handwritten pamphlets were old media. But today we look at things like books, newspaper, films, radio, and even TV as being old media new media being the internet, smartphones, digital media, and the rise of all the social networking platforms, YouTube, Facebook, and the like. What tends to happen, though, over the past couple of decades is a conversion process. And this refers to the process where the differences between the old and new are kind of disappearing. And so, um, you know, things like camera phones and internet radio. So people seem to still want to be able to engage with those old forms of um, media, but they seem to be increasingly either filtered through or put upon these new technologies. Newspapers are a good example where, um, you know, they create their own apps for the iPad that make it feel like you are actually reading a newspaper more than kind of just looking on a screen. Same with things like the Kindle and Kobo uh, book readers. Very broadly, media technology is te technologically developed um, forms of human communication that mediate reality for us. I'll talk about some aspects of that more throughout. Importantly, from a sociological perspective, we're interested in the way that media um, and power kind of interrelate. So there's media and there's pop culture, and pop culture is a certain kind of, I suppose, um, important aspect of what the media um, uh, represents and what it um, uses um, in its different kind of aspects. So it's popular culture is more about the, the way of life, the lifestyle things that we do, the customs, ritual, pastimes, things for leisure more often than not, like music, fashion, TV, sports, video games. So video games in particular is at the moment the biggest culture industry. It's actually outstripped um, the film and music industry. Um, and certainly in Australia, watching sport and drinking alcohol are kind of key um, popular cultural practices. Going shopping is also another one. So it's interesting here that like consumer culture and popular culture very much collide in those things. And if you think about the way the media works, much of it is advertising, encouraging us to, you know, go to sport, drink alcohol and go shopping. So this is what um, critical sociologists are particularly interested in looking at, those relationships between how those media messages influence the decisions and choices that we make. Importantly, and we'll, I'll look at this in some detail throughout the rest of this lecture, but also in the future weeks in the course as well, is that even something like, you know, consuming alcohol, it's not done in the same way um, across the board in a culture. Within Australia, you know, the consumption of alcohol is done very differently by different people. There's distinctions between them. Um, there's different kind of status systems uh, and the kind of, you know, the silly photos here kind of express um, uh, kind of hyper-real examples of that, really. But it's important to remember that, like, 
culture isn't kind of monolithic. There's very different um, activities going on, um, even though um, they are kind of the same thing, drinking alcohol, but it's done very differently by different people. So throughout this lecture, and particularly the week on class, uh, we'll look at different aspects of that. Okay, I'll stop this part of the lecture here.